Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to Henry and the rest of the organizers for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. What I'd like to describe today are a bunch of uh, awfully classical results um, that were motivated by a discussion that has started again over the past four or five years on the problem of estimating a f uh, an information theoretic functional which is called uh, directed information. And there's a lot of interesting results and there's many more interesting applications in different areas. And as these things develop, I thought it'd be useful to fill in some of the basic uh, gaps in the theory of what can fundamentally be done. So I'll talk about the problem of estimating directed information from actual data. And uh, I will try to describe how this connects to uh, a very uh, important and um, very simple and classical, yet in, in its applications very modern hypothesis test, which is that of testing temporal causality. Causality, as of course everybody knows, is a very hard concept to get a hold of. We'll talk about a very specific type of causality, which is the following, and I'll describe all of this in very great detail in a minute, but imagine that you have two time series, a time series Y, Y1, Y2, up to some point, and a parallel time series X, and you want to predict the values of Y. Typically one thinks about uh, uh, synchronous signals, and the, for example they can be stock prices, or the Ys can be the, the successive values of some financial instrument. You want to predict the next value, and you ask the following, if I know the past values of Y, in my prediction, does it also help to know the past values of x? Or do I have some kind of conditional independence? This is what we call temporal causality. The fact that knowing the past uh, of uh, y is not sufficient to predict y optimally unless we also know x. When that happens, we say that x temporally uh, influences y. Another example that I'd like to think of for those of you that have uh, experience with teenagers, my teenage son is in the audience, is I can think of X as the things I say and Y as the things my son does. Okay, so there may be some causality depending on what I say and what he does or there may not be. This is an open problem in our house. Okay. Uh, so um, let me start by defining uh, exactly what directed information is. We have two time series, X and Y, and we take them to be finite valued with possibly different alphabets. The alphabets can be arbitrary. The fact that I've chosen numbers is, of course, irrelevant. And the directed information is just a formal, this is just a formal definition. We'll delve into it much in much more detail. Um, the directed information between the block X1N and Y1N, I use this notation X1 through N, uh, is defined as the entropy of the block Y minus the sum of the causally conditional entropies of each YI given its own past and the X sequence up to time I. Okay, this is a definition. This is the direct information. We'll see in a moment what it means and why it's important to us. And as usual, for the entire process, one likes to talk about the direct information rate. So we divide by N and take the limit. When the limit exists, we say that this is the direct information rate. Right. So I don't know all of you, and I know this is a diverse audience, although not uh, very enormous, so please stop me if people have different backgrounds and anything is not clear. Okay? Now the direct information is uh, very important. It's been discovered independently. It's popped up independently in different fields. In information theory, it became uh, popular through the work of Massey that was based on work of Marco when he wanted to characterize feedback capacity. We will talk about the capacity of channels with feedback. There's a lot of work in that area. All these dot, dot, dots mean that this is a very small and very partial list of people that have worked in this area. The dual problem of compression with feed forward has also been studied. There's questions that have to do with uh, causal and distributed compression and uh, hypothesis testing that involve directed information. There's questions in communications, in control, in switching and sensor networks that involve directed information. Um, in physics, there's a quantity called transfer entropy, which, was, which appeared independently, and it's exactly what we call directed information, and there it plays a, an important role in the study of dynamical systems. In economics, maybe this was the first time someone wrote down exactly the formula more than 30 years ago, 
trying to deal with questions like the one I mentioned as an example at the beginning. Good morning. Uh, and they call directed information a callback causality measure. And more recently, and uh, this is probably the sexiest application, is people studying neuroscience where they want to uh, uh, establish uh, some formal uh, understanding of how different synchronous signals in the brain between different neurons influence each other. And there's a lot of applications there. Now, if you look at all this literature, you see that the operational role played by uh, directed information is slightly indirect in that it's never its value that we're interested in. It's not like entropy, where you want to know the entropy. You want to know how many bits you need to describe something. It's usually somewhat indirect in that uh, it's like uh, mutual information when you talk about capacity. Usually, you want to maximize it in order to understand some channel. It's not its value itself that's important, but it's some indirect uh, optimization problem. And the same thing happens here. And one thing I asked myself, trying to be perfectly honest, was why do you want to estimate it? Why would you ever care? Somebody tells you that the direct information between these two signals in the brain is three bits. So what? What does that three bit mean? And a first answer, and this is only slightly incorrect, is to say that the only reason you want to estimate it is to see if it's zero or not. This is in almost all, not all of the applications, but almost all the applications I've managed to find, this is really what you're interested in. You want to see if the direct information is zero or not, which corresponds to whether or not there is causal influence from one signal to another. So in order to describe our results, it's easier to remind you of perhaps the most classical example in statistics. Maybe 50% of all statistics studies do the following. They have two variables, and they want to see if they are correlated or not. There's no question of causality here. You have IID data pairs, X and Y, and you want to know if the Xs are independent of the Ys. So the Xs, for example, can be binary of whether or not the patient took a drug, and the Ys can be the effect on their health. Okay, so you have independent patients. You randomly choose to whom you give your drug, and then you measure the response Y, and you want to see if the Xs and the Ys are independent. This is the most classical, one of the most classical problems in statistics and probably the most commonly used. And how do you deal with this problem? One thing to do is you say, ah, I want to know if the joint distribution of X and Y is the product of the marginals. Okay, so a simple way to do it is I look at the empirical distributions. I count the frequencies. Okay, I, looked at, I look at the empirical distribution of the pairs of values and I compare it with the product of the empirical distributions uh, of the x's times the empirical distributions of the y's. One way to do it, if you're Pearson, and it's uh, 80 years ago, is you look at the distance between these two in terms of the chi-square distance. This is the normalized chi-square distance between this distribution and this product distribution, times n. Right? So I take the sum of all the values, I subtract one from the other, take the square, and divide by the second one. And you say, ah, if they are close, if this is close to zero, they're close to being independent. If they're not close, then it seems that like they're not. And it's been at least 100 years of debate of how to make sense of what I just said. And here's sort of the orthodox dogma of statistics. There is a mathematical theorem underlying what you're going to do, which says that under the null hypothesis, if the x's and the y's are independent, then I know the limiting distribution of this statistic, of this number. It's a chi-square distribution, and the nice thing about this chi-square distribution is that it does not depend at all on the distributions of the x's and the y's. It only depends on the sizes of their alphabets. So here's what you do. Somebody gives you the values. You take the results of the cl clinical trials. You compute the value of that statistic, and you compute its probability under the null hypothesis, under the independence hypothesis. If it's very small, you say, ah, oh, it's very unlikely that this data came from independent uh, realizations. I reject the null hypothesis. If it's not small enough, then you can make uh, no uh, definitive statements. You never uh, accept the null. You either reject it or you say, I'm not able to reject it. This is sort of the dogma of statistics, right? And this is probably I'm boring all of you because this is very uh, basic and introductory. Um, and what... Uh, 
What one observes when one tries to understand this or teach it, which is how I came to learn it, is you look at uh, how you prove this theorem and you realize that there's no reason to start off with the chi-square distance. There are more natural distances and if they're not more natural, there are other distances as well that you might think about and one that's familiar to all of us is the relative entropy distance or the kullback library divergence. So you may say, okay, why look at the chi-square distance and not look at the relative entropy between these two, the, uh, the empirical of the pairs and the product of the empiricals. Again, you observe that you have the same limiting distribution. And this is no uh, accident. You can, you can perform the same test either with the chi-square statistics or with this delta n statistic that I haven't named yet. I'll name it now when I tell you what it is. One thing you notice is that the chi-squared statistic, if you do a Taylor expansion of the log in the relative entropy, the first term is the chi-squared distance. So you can think of the chi-square statistic as a quadratic approximation to the more fundamental nonlinear statistic delta n. Why more fundamental? Because it has very many uh, interpretations that are both interesting in terms of gaining intuition about the problem and technically they give us many more tools. So first of all, we defined it as a relative entropy or a Kullback library divergence, which is a quantity that we like. Uh, second, it can be expressed as uh, the log likelihood ratio of these two empirical distributions, right? Third, it can be expressed as the um, classical likelihood ratio test statistic in terms of the maximum likelihood estimates. In other words, the empirical is the maximum likelihood distribution. If you look at all distributions on the pairs, the empirical distribution is the maximum likelihood distribution. If I look at all product distributions, then the product of the empiricals is the maximum likelihood uh, estimate. So we have also this interpretation. And finally, if you play around just a little bit, you do some very simple algebraic manipulations, you notice that this is the, re well, it should be obvious from the first expression, this is also a mutual information. Right? It's a mutual information between two random variables that have joint distribution given by the empirical. So this is what, uh, in the information theory literature, people call the plug-in estimate of the mutual information. If your goal was to estimate the mutual information, the first thing you would do if you had only seen the definition would be to try and estimate the joint distribution by the empirical. It's the simplest thing. You plug it into the formula, you get a value. Okay. So this is uh, sort of a summary of the path we just took. We wanted to test for independence. Uh, we looked at the chi-square test that led to the chi-square statistic. We noticed that we can think of it as uh, a quadratic approximation to the likelihood ratio test statistic. And we noticed that then we can interpret that as the plug-in estimate of a mutual information. What I'd like to do is take the opposite path when dealing with directed information instead of mutual information. Okay, are we clear so far? Because again, most of you I don't know, yeah? Okay, so what we'll do is we'll start by looking at the problem of estimating directed information. We'll define the plug-in estimator. We'll identify it with a test statistic in a more complex hypothesis test. We'll prove some results about its asymptotics. We'll answer some questions that have been open for a few years now. And then we'll design some hypothesis test, tests. And I'll even show you some results on real data in the end. Okay. So let's be a little more precise here. Here are some assumptions that may seem uh, at first very restrictive, but all of them can be relaxed. I'm just uh, stating them so that the, the notation and the presentation are simpler. We have two stationary processes producing our signals, X and Y, uh, with possibly different alphabets, finite alphabets, and we assume that the pair process, X and Y, is a Markov chain and it has some memory length k. We don't know it, or we may know it, but at least we know some bound on it. We know that its memory is no bigger than some k. And we'll also, also assume that the marginal process y is itself Markovian. And again, this may seem restrictive, but all of these are um, assumptions that can be relaxed. And we'll further as assume that all transitions are possible from any context, you can go to any pair of possible values with non-zero probability. Okay, this is, again is just to simplify the presentation. 
these assumptions are very close to the simplest set of assumptions that allow us to write the directed information rate as a functional of only the finite dimensional distributions of the process. Remember, this rate is a limit as n goes to infinity. These assumptions, or something close to them, are the simplest assumptions that I know, and I suspect are the simplest assumptions that can be uh, written down, that guarantee that this rate can be written down explicitly as a, a function of the finite dimensional distributions of the process without having to look at infinite dimensional limits. And here we have a conditional mutual information and it's the mutual information that one would expect. It's the mutual information between the current value of y and the corresponding values of x up to that point given its past. And this is really our question. It's, it's already contained here. We want to see given the past of y whether or not there is a strong relationship between the next value of y and the values of x up to that point. Okay. This is a very simple observation. It's been made before. And uh, the directed information rate in this case has the interpretation that I've already mentioned several times. First of all, it's zero if and only if we have this conditional independence property. The directed information rate is zero only when the present value of y, given its past, is independent of the x's. Right. Uh, and in economics, usually, this is uh, phrased uh, by saying that the directed information rate is zero if and only if x has no temporal or predictive influence on y. OK, so what can we do with this uh, functional? We can define what is the obvious thing uh, one would start with. And I should say that maybe it isn't because there is already quite a bit of literature on the problem of directed information and no one has done this. So there have been more sophisticated estimators using context-free weighting and uh, parametric models, especially people like Todd Coleman and uh, Liam Paninsky in neuroscience have uh, come up with much more sophisticated estimators, but uh, we thought it'd be, that's why I said in the beginning that these are awfully classical results because I thought it's strange that this, was, that this had not been the starting point. And as we'll see, looking at this very simple estimator reveals some uh, important fundamental results that also influence these other studies. Okay, so what we'll do is we have this finite dimensional functional, the directed information rate, and we'll define an estimate of this as the corresponding formula for the empirical distributions. Okay, you compute the empirical distributions for blocks of length k plus one, and you plug them into the formula. Okay? Yeah? Uh, given that this is a Markov chain, wouldn't it make more sense to look at the empirical distribution of transitions versus, uh, versus the actual positions of the Markov chain? The same thing. Same thing. It's uh, formally, formally you... Uh, uh, you're right, it's because you look at the past. You look at the past, you either divide them or you don't divide them. In fact, I should say, that's what we do. We, uh, when you actually write down proofs, you look at estimates of transition matrices. Yes. Because that's how you do your whole parametrization that we'll see in a minute. Yeah, it depends on if it's a homogeneous Markov chain. It is. So if it's homogeneous, then you do better estimating just the transition probability. Yeah, yeah. If it's not a homogeneous Markov chain, then you can't do anything. Yeah. No, you just get the you have to have some str well you have to know something you have to know something you're a physicist right no well, physicists is not a problem physicists <laughs> not a problem but physicists are the only people that are arrogant enough to dare to speak about non homogeneous markov chains uh, so the simplest way to describe this and to define it is via these joint distributions. But when you look at the proofs, of course, all your parameterizations are in terms of uh, conditional distributions, as you said. Now, the first thing you observe is that this is a continuous functional on the interior of a uh, finite, large but finite dimensional probability space. And uh, 
since our conditions guarantee that the joint processes are godic, stationary, I mean, uh, not, not necessarily stationary, but uh, irreducible and aperiodic, has a unique stationary measure, and these estimates converge with probability one. Okay, and how quickly do they converge? Um, this is entirely uninteresting to prove, but surprisingly technical and difficult. If you, the central limit theorem for Markov chains is the first time that you see that Markov chains are really different from independent observations. The, the variance for the Markov central limit theorem is a genuinely infinite dimensional object. What I'm trying to say is that this is a very simple result that says that not only, this is what you'd expect, not only this estimator converges to the true value, but it actually uh, is asymptotically normal. Uh, the rate at which it converges is 1 over square root of n, and there's a variance, which is this awful uh, limit here. Um, and it, the, the proof is very classical. It's based on what people would do in 1960, but it's uh, not entirely obvious how to do it. There's, uh, there's uh, an a lot of uninteresting technicalities that one needs to take care of. You just use repeatedly the central limit theorem, the law of iterated logarithm for Markov chains. You do the work, you get the result. It's not hard. One thing that's uh, fun to note is that in view of some recent work by Jiao and Permuter and uh, Weissman, uh, this is the best rate that you can get. There's no estimator that converges faster. Best so? what? The best rate, right. the best convergence rate. Which is somewhat surprising if you think about it. Well, we're doing something very silly. We're <laughs> doing way overfitting here, right? We're looking at the empirical distribution of all these blocks. We're not doing anything smart. We're just counting frequencies. And yet, this is, in a strong sense, the best you can do. But this is good to know because the fact that you can't do any better was shown by Jiao et al. But they didn't have some estimator that achieved this rate. So this is the first estimator, the obvious estimator, that achieves this optimum rate. Now, I should say, the reason I asked in the beginning if there are any, any statisticians here is that because of the more modern theory of asymptotic statistics by Hayek and Lecam and others that came about in the 70s and 80s, this is obvious in some ways, at least on an intuitive level, that this is the best you can do and that this is the rate. Nevertheless, it's, uh, we felt it was... Um, fun to actually have it written down so that people can compare. So this is the first result. The second thing you notice is that the important special case when the directed information rate is zero, when there's no causal influence, if this is zero, then the variance is zero. So you converge to a degenerate normal. So what happens then? That's the null distribution. It's always the more. Maybe silly question, but, but the special case of this is the IID case, for which one over ten is uh, optimal. So w why is it not immediate that, that this is you can do better than one over ten? That 10, you cannot do better than one over ten. Yes. So why do you need the theorem for if the, even in the special case it's already one over ten in the trivial case? <laughs> yeah. I think that the IID case is uh, what they use to prove that you can't do better. Mm -hmm. Yes. I see. Yes. In the IID case, this is already is this already non-trivial? Yes, because you have x zero y zero. Yes, you're right. Yes. So by looking at the IID case, is how you prove the converse, or it would be obviously. But in the IID case, you have to do some work. No, maybe, well, to prove that this is the best you can do, again, you have to look at some classical results yeah. by Kramer. But uh, for the converse, it suffices to look at the IID case. I think you're right. Yeah. The IID pairs. Yes, I think you're right. So here we notice, uh, as I said, any other questions? This is generally the rate. The rate of convergence is of the order of 1 over square root of n improbability. And, uh, but it seems like it might be faster under the null hypothesis, when we have ind conditional independence, when we have no temporal causality, uh, or equivalently when the directed information rate is 0. It's easy to check that this is 0. This variance is 0. Uh, 
And uh, as one suspects there, you have uh, faster convergence. You have convergence at the rate of 1 over n, which is again what happens in the simple story of independence that we saw in the beginning. In that case, when the direct information rate is 0, this converges to 0 at the rate of 1 over n. And in fact, if you multiply by n, you get a chi-square distribution with this many degrees of freedom. And notice again the, the, the important fact here and the elegant part of the theorem is that the limiting distribution does not depend on anything else other than the alphabet sizes and the memory size. For any pair process that has a temporal independence like that, you have this limiting distribution for this uh, estimator. And this, of course, uh, suggests that you may have an interesting hypothesis test, uh, that you may be able to perform a reasonable hypothesis does not do what people have been doing up to now is they've, they've come up with an estimator, they've plotted the values, and then they've said, ah, it looks like it's not going to zero. So there is temporal causality. Or it's pretty small. Maybe there's no temporal causality. Of course, this is what we teach our students in their first year, that you don't just eyeball your data when you do estimation. There's a, an orthodox dogma of hypothesis testing that we can, of course, argue about, but there is uh, some uh, general theory that tells you how to quantify these things. And this is what uh, one can actually do in this case. And I'll, I'll say, uh, as I said, I'll, I'll show you some actual data in a moment. So before I describe the proof of this, I would like to phrase this result in terms of hypothesis testing. And this, is, this comes back to your question. We want a, a grand hypothesis that looks at all joint uh, pair processes that are Markovian of order of memory length no more than k. And these are parameterized by these transition matrices. This is Q of a, b of the pair, given the uh, pair of k blocks in the past. And they're parameterized by a parameter theta, which is this many dimensional. These are how many contexts you have. And these are how many probabilities you have for each context. And when you have no causal influence, when y, given its past, is conditionally independent of x up to that time, then these transition matrices can be decomposed in this form, where you just look at, the, at y, given its past, and then at x, given everything else. This simplifies the structure of the transition matrix. And these are parameterized by a smaller dimensional space, which is naturally embedded in the larger space. And um, this is. Uh, how you write down the statistical problem, you look at the log likelihood ratio. So first of all, you look at the log likelihood of uh, the joint process. And then you look at the log likelihood ratio test statistic, which means what? You maximize the log likelihood over all models, and you subtract or you divide, if you don't take logs, by the maximum likelihood over all models that are temporally independent, that have this conditional independence property. And you look at this likelihood ratio test statistic. This is very simple. And it's, although the notation looks a little uh, complex, it's very elegant. If you write it down, it turns out that this log likelihood ratio test statistic is exactly the plug-in estimator. This is nice. It's not surprising. It's not unexpected. It's very easy to prove. But it's uh, a nice thing to have that these two things that have apparently very different origins turn out to be the same quantity. And then you say, ah, my plug-in estimator is just the classical log, maximum log likelihood ratio test statistic. And for this, there's a very rich theory. And if you look, there's <coughs> a, a short monograph by Billingsley that uh, has all the asymptotic results that you may want. They're very easy to derive, and you can just point to that result and say, this quantity under the null hypothesis has a chi-square distribution. This is how we prove this theorem. By considering the hypothesis test, rewriting the plug-in estimate as a likelihood ratio test statistic, and then referring to Billingsley. Again, there's a lot of uh, pedantry. Is that the word? Pedagogy. I'm sorry? Pedantry. No, pedantic is one thing. Pedagogy. Pedantry. Pedantry. No. 
Being pedantic. Being pedantic. Okay, if that's a word, there's a lot of uh, pedantic steps here. Uh, and, and there is some work to be done, although it's not fascinating work, and then you get the result. So, now we have this interesting theory. We have uh, the plug-in estimator. We know it converges always at the optimal rate of 1 over square root of n. We know that under the null hypothesis when it's zero it converges faster at a rate of 1 over n. We know it has a limit in chi-square distribution and we have designed implicitly in the proof we just designed the hypothesis test. So maybe we can try and use this hypothesis test. So I looked and I saw what the most recent paper in the information theory transactions did in this, in this case. So this is the paper by Zhao, Permuter and um, uh, Tsahi Weissman. Uh, where they looked at data from the stock market in New York and the stock market in Hong Kong. And the reason they looked at these two is because they're 12 hours apart, which means they're never open at the same time. Okay. So you can talk about temporal causality and see if the past values of the index of one of the two stock markets influences the other. Okay. So they looked at uh, about 23 years of data and we looked at the same data and they said, here's what we'll do. We'll assume that there's memory of order no, no larger than five days. And we'll see, we'll estimate the conditional, the directed informations from Hong Kong to New York and from New York to Hong Kong and see if there's temporal causality in one direction or in the other direction or in, or in neither. They use a different estimator um, and these are the results they get. Okay, this is uh, New York to Hong Kong, and this is Hong Kong to New York. And they say, ah, there's bigger influence New York to Hong Kong, as one would expect. The smaller influence Hong Kong to New York. And this is, they say, significantly, ah, you see there's even, a, someone has circled here on the screen. You see there's a faint blue circle. <laughs> Uh, they say, ah, there's significant non-zero influence here. This is pretty convincing if all you want to do is eyeball the data, but we know better and we say, okay, let's look at the actual numbers and see what they tell us. Let's not just look at the estimates, but perform our hypothesis test like pedantic statisticians that we are. Okay, and this is what happens. We took the same data. It's a lot of data. It's 6,159 days. It's about 23 years, except weekends and holidays. These are the two uh, indices of the stock markets. Uh, and here are the p-values you get. This is not small. These p-values are not smaller than 5%. I remind you that typically we set a threshold for our p-values. So if the p-value is smaller than 5% or 10% if you want to be lenient, then I reject the null. Here, there's no way you can reject the null. There is no way based on the data that you have sufficient evidence to say that there's temporal causality. This is one of the many examples that uh, are pedagogically useful to say just looking at the data, Looks convincing, but then you have to do some number crunching and often you get surprises. And I'm not at all saying that this earlier work was uh, not good. It is very good, but there's a, a next step, which is to try and quantify these things more precisely. And this is uh, the type of result you get. What we did uh, to be slightly more specific is we took the plug-in estimate for the directed information in both directions, from x to y and from y to x. There's a slight difference. We assumed that there is no temporal causality. We looked at the, under the null hypothesis. We have the limiting distributions, which is chi-squared. Based on this, you can compute the probability of the statistic. This is what's called the p-value. If under the null, the probability of the statistic is very small, then you say that you reject the null. Here, the probability of the statistic under the null is enormous. We cannot reject the null hypothesis. So, based on this evidence alone, we cannot say that there is temporal causality. We cannot say that we reject the null hypothesis. In other words, the data is inconclusive. It is very inconclusive. Okay. So, uh, we played around with, uh, I'm not going to show you simulation examples because they're all exactly as you'd expect from uh, 
knowing that underlying or this is nothing more than the central limit theorem, you get exactly what you'd expect. We have a lot of uh, numerical values. Uh, what I would like to say is that when we submitted this paper, we got the most thorough and useful and substantial reviews I've ever gotten for a paper. It's a, a vast literature out there, a lot of which I wasn't aware of. We got some very um, useful uh, feedback, um, some of which is mentioned here. One thing that is important is that all the assumptions we've made can be relaxed. Uh, we don't need to assume that the processes are stationary, although they have to be homogeneous. Uh, the transition matrix doesn't need to be all positive. This is just a, a technical convenience. There are very strong results that one can get for the convergence of these estimators, bo both uh, like the low later logarithm rates of convergence and uh, for uh, LP bounds. In Trying to understand the convergence of the directed information rate estimators, we came up with two new hypothesis tests. Why two? Because, ah, you missed the best part. No. <laughs> not, not convinced. Uh, in our case, like in the case we described in the beginning for independence, you have the log likelihood ratio test that corresponds to this plug-in estimator of the directed information, or you can look at the corresponding chi-square distance. Again, one is a quadratic approximation to the other, and you can have a chi-square test or a log likelihood ratio test. They're asymptotically equivalent. And one thing that we observed that's fun is that this kind of type of causality testing does not require that you assume that the data itself is Markovian. You test for Markovian causality, but the data can be arbitrary. It's a subtle distinction, but in applications it's important. It means that in terms of sort of the natural philosophy part, I'm not assuming that the data that you're presenting me with have this very strong lack of memory property. They can be anywhere. What I can test is a very limited case of temporal causality. This is uh, also useful uh, to uh, observe. We have a lot of uh, examples of applications on both simulated data and real data. You'd be surprised at how broad the range of data people have looked at is from wind measurements in uh, New Zealand to neuroscience data. And this type of causality apparently is of great interest in different walks of science. And finally, this is something that I also learned from uh, these, the reviews we got from the paper. The modern theory of asymptotic statistics based on uh, LeCam and Hayek's local asymptotic normality condition gives you much more powerful optimality results. You can get stronger results than what we got, but more importantly, you can get a much more um, systematic view of the field. In other words, after having done this work, after having been re-educated over what's happened in asymptotic statistics over the past 30 years, I feel that the results that we have are obvious. But the fact that they're obvious, I hope, is not uh, the same as saying that uh, they're not useful. Indeed, we find that entering this discussion of estimating directed information and using these tools in practice, both in signal processing and in other biological and other financial applications, uh, completes the discussion of figuring out what can actually be done in practice. So I'll stop here. <laughs>